Um, I want to start by thanking another group. I want to thank just I'm gonna, at the beginning, because I always forget at the end, I want to thank all the students and people who worked on these projects. Uh, these are some current and former students in my lab that were pretty instrumental in these projects. Keith Applebaum, Mark Descala, Effie Capnewell, and Kayleen Schreiber in particular. Um, Allard and Jennifer are both linguists at various places that I've collaborated with. A lot of the theoretical work was done with them. Uh, Joe Toscano is a former student of mine who did some of the ERP work. And, and one of the last studies you're going to read about is a new collaboration with Jan Edwards at Maryland. So we all know it's hard to recognize peach. <laughs> da, da, da. Why? Um, well, you know, it's sort of been long argued, it, 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 I don't know, 1950 on, that you know, the acoustic signal has a lot of variability. So here's a spectrogram of a word. Some of you might be able to read it. Um, and you might say, OK, great, this bit of Q here, the spectral mean is an esh. And there's a first form and a second form, and that gives me an eh. You know, perhaps this is the word ship. Um, but the problem is that these Q values can be consistent with multiple phonemes, right? So this could also be an S, maybe if it had some co-articulation or if it was spoken uh, by a man. Uh, this could be an E, depending on this and that. And every Q is, in fact, affected by multiple factors. So this uh, uh, spectral mean here is also going to be affected by the vowel, and the fricative is going to affect this. And of course, there's factors like the talker who's going to affect all of this and my extremely fast speech rate, right? So, so we're talking about a multi-cost system here. Um, and, and the result, and I think a lot of phoneticians concluded this a long time ago, is that purely bottom-up approaches to speech perception are not likely to be successful. Now, let me give you an example of that. This is an example I, I do for my, my speech perception seminar when they let me teach it. Uh, here's two fricatives. This is an S and this is an S. You can see the centroid of the frication spectrum is pretty different here. We'll call that the spectral mean. And we went and measured almost 3,000 S's and S's. Uh, for their spectral means, and you can see the sort of distribution here. Now, if I find the optimal boundary, which is you know, somewhere in here, I get about 11% error. That's not too bad, but that's not that great. Humans get about 1% error, right? So, so I, I put this up, and the students go, oh, that's dumb, right? Like, there's lots more cues. You could use the formats or something. Yeah. What do you mean exactly by Acoustic cone. Yeah. Like, you take, take the signal. Find some boundaries, find some categories, find some thresholds, use whatever you want, and, and pull it out of it. Now, uh, not all of them, no, actually, right? In the, in the training structure, as a lot of people were alluding to today, they implicitly learn to do all sorts of interesting things, to, to pull out talker information, to normalize for co-articulatory context. So, so I would not call those purely bottom-up. I'll just withdraw the term bottom up then. I don't want to get in an argument with the <laughs> ASR folks. My point was the simple metric where you look at Q values and decide if it's a sour shot isn't going to work. Okay. Whatever you want to call it. And I don't want to impugn the fine work of the actually wonderful ASR stuff we've seen today here. Um, so you could say, let's add a second Q. Let's add the second form and frequency. We'll find a diagonal boundary. And, and we'll do better, right? Now, uh, a few years ago, Oller Youngman and I decided to call this bluff. I actually thought this was going to work. It didn't, um, so I was wrong. You'll see three examples of me being wrong in this talk. It happens a lot. Actually, a fourth, if you, if you count my, my mischaracterization of the term bottom-up. Um, we collected almost 3,000 recordings of the eight fricatives of English from 20 different speakers, six different vowels. It's a pretty realistic challenge. And we measured 24 different cues that phoneticians have determined. Um, here's some of them. You, you can see all this stuff. This took forever to measure. It was horrible. Um, we get every cue we could find in the literature, and we looked at four new cues that we thought were plausible, but that phoneticians hadn't actually measured yet. And then we took a subset of these and just said to a listener, which one is this? Is this is S, is this F, is it F, and so forth, right? So, so we have a perfect situation to investigate this. If accurate speech perception can be achieved by just combining enough information, this, this should be sufficient. Now, humans got to about 91.2% correct on this. So that's our, our target. It's not perfect, actually. There's a lot of noise. And I'll, I'll show you why that is in a little bit. When we give it all the cues, here's human performance for each of the eight fricatives. Here's the model. The model was very simple, by the way. It was just logistic regression. Uh, we've done this with backpropagation models. We've done this with exemplar models. We get the same results. Um, so it's not a question of just putting a more powerful classifier on the same information. But you can see the model does pretty good, but it sort of undershoots in a lot of places. Now, we did ask, well, does it even help to use all these cues? And you can see it does. These are if we just take the 10 best cues. And you can see you know, model performance goes up by about 5 to 8% there. So more information is better, but not as good as listeners. And as, as a phonetician, I was like, well, why shouldn't it be? We literally measured everything. And we had this kind of supervised learning in this logistic regression. This is a pretty optimal classifier. Like We, we should be doing better. <laughs> 
But here's the problem with the whole add more cues approach. If the spectral mean is too high for an S, it's probably too high because the tongue is in the wrong place. And if the tongue is in the wrong place, it also means the second foreman is a little bit too high or a little too low. It also means all the other cues are going to be affected. All of these 24 cues being measured are fundamentally the result of an articulator. And a lot of this is differences in the articulation. And you can actually see the variance. So these are just some of the cues. You can see that every single one of these cues says some component of variance due to who the talker is, some component of what the fricative was, major components of what the vowel was. And, and this is all, these are all highly correlated. So what do we need to do? Well, what I want to tell you about today is an alternative. And maybe you guys already know this. And that's fine if you do. I'll just stop early. Which is the idea that rather than treating the input as something to be classified, we treat the input as something to be tested against. You're testing a hypothesis. So maybe you have the hypothesis that this is me saying sheep. And you're going to say, well, what would the input look like if it was Bob saying sheep versus if it was Eddie saying ship? Eddie, you want to say ship for us? Ship. Pretty different, right? Um, <laughs> and so if you, <laughs> sorry, Eddie, you, you went before me, so now everybody recognized you. Um, it was, it was. So this is clearly not consistent with the Chang, uh, with the McMurray ship. Um, so the idea is that rather than just classifying the input, we're trying to explain it. What causal factors gave rise to this input? Now, it's rare in life at any given moment during real-time processing that a listener would be ready to make a fully formed hypothesis. Like this is Eddie saying the word ship in a flat affect because he's kind of sad. You're not sad, are you? Um, Rather, at any given moment, you might know some things, but not other things. You might know who the talker is, but you don't yet know the vowel, right? Or you might know that it's this dialect, but you don't know much about the talker. So is there a way to take this idea of data explanation or hypothesis testing in a more incremental way that, that listeners might be able to do in, if, we're, if we're thinking about this as a model for how listeners handle speech? So we developed this model, which we had to give it a lame acronym to get it published, which is very odd. We called it Secure. They wouldn't publish it without an acronym. This is the thing about psych review. Um, so we gave it this model, Secure. And the idea is very simple. What you do is once you know something about the speech, you parcel it out. And then you use the residuals to do useful work. So this is, this is a corpus of as and us that Jennifer Cole and I collected. They have lots of different articulatory contexts, lots of different talkers. Imagine you know nothing about it. There's a cluster here and a cluster here. You might like to say, oh, one's a, uh, one's a. Uh. Well, they're not, actually. Uh, these are our males and these are our females. And you can see that, in fact, the um, phonetic variance is slightly different than the immediate clustering. Now, if we take a simple model here where the listener says, oh, I know that's a male talker. What is the average formant frequency of a male? Oh, it's you know, 500 hertz or whatever it is. I'm now going to recode all the formants relative to those expectations and repeat, rinse, repeat for other things you might know. And when you do that, you can turn this mess into nearly invariant categories. Um, so we accounted for 95% of the variance in F1 and 90% in F2 using just four factors. Right? So we've really pulled a lot of the variance out using a very simple procedure. So Allard and I said, let's take our fricative corpus, where we actually have listener data, and apply the same idea. So we took these 24 cues, we partialed out the talker, we partialed out the neighboring vowel, we fed all that information back into our simple classifier, and look what we get. Now, the compensation model is doing pretty similarly to listeners. Uh, ooh, the percentages are gone here, but it's a range that's right around 91.2. And you can see by comparison, it's doing much better than the all cues model. What was even more interesting is if you look at the patterns of errors, uh, listeners tend to do very well with fricatives that are in front of an oo, uh, and less well with fricatives that are in front of an e. Uh, it has to do with the way co-articulation colors the sounds. You can see the raw cues get the exact wrong pattern, but once you put in the compensation, when it's sensitive to those relationships, it's not. Now, if we just feed the listeners the fricatives in isolation, so just sss and shh, they no longer know who the talker was. They no longer know who the vowel is. Now this model, the raw cue model, is a better predictor of behavior. So it looks like when you have access to knowledge, you can start to do much better. So wait, how does this work? Well, it's super simple. You imagine you, you decode speech into whole bunches of different cues. You can use any ones you want. We just chose some phonetic ones. Maybe you start to identify the talker. Maybe you start to identify the fricative. 
As you get a sense of who the talker is, though, you can now compute expected Q values for that talker. And you can relativize. You can say, this F1 is higher than expected. This spectral mean is lower than expected. You can now use that to better identify the fricative. And as you keep going, identifying other factors like preceding or following phonemes, you can make those predictions even tighter. So take, for example, voicing. Uh, the fundamental frequency was not a very good cue for voicing in our corpus. Uh, voice sounds tend to have a fundamental frequency of 148, voice of 160. You can see the variance is huge. Uh, and let's say you got a token with 154 hertz. I don't know. Could be voiced, could be voiceless, right? But if you know that it came from me, and I have a high squeaky voice of about 130 hertz, um, then you can recode it. This is actually um, 24 hertz higher than I would expect from Bob, right? It's, it's higher than I should produce. And my variance is actually positive and negative 6. So it means that I can unidentify and unidentify unambiguously identify this as voiceless, right? So once I, I know the talker, the relative information is much better than the absolute information. So it's the difference between the cue and the expectations that's the source of information. That's what the, we're arguing the perceptual system uses for categorization. And these expectations could, in principle, come from anything. It could come from the talker, neighboring phonemes, maybe lexical level predictions, things like dialect or affect. I mean, we've only begun to explore some of these possibilities. But if you go back and you look in the literature, like some of the work that Keith was talking about this morning, these are good examples of these kinds of processes. I wouldn't say they're proof of them, but they're examples of, of what we're talking about. So in this sense, perception isn't about classification. It's about explaining the data. The goal of perception is to account for sources of variability in the data. And once you can account for some of it, the stuff that's left over becomes more useful. Now, this is a form of what we would call predictive coding in neuroscience. This is not so different than the Rao and Ballard or the Denny Walpert sort of approach to motor control. Um, but what's a little bit different here is that expectations can go from, can derive from very abstract knowledge about speech, about talkers, for example. And this can be used to then form expectations about the sensory properties input. Now, these kinds of models are often done with sort of Bayesian approaches or analysis by synthesis approaches. I want to show you the code for this model because, I mean, it was really impressive. Um, that's it. We used linear regression. We actually used SPSS, which I know isn't cool. We should have used R. Um, <laughs> so, but, you know, you can't always be cool. So I want to give you a couple of predictions of this approach that we've tested recently. And the first is this. If we give listeners some information about the source of a fricative, it might enable them, enable them to get more information out of it. So we gave listeners a very hard task. We gave them fricatives in isolation, s or sh or tss, right? That's all they heard. And their job was to guess the next vowel. Now, this task is so dumb, I told Allard he had to run it in Kansas. I wasn't running it in my lab, because we do cool things like eye tracking. And we were like, no, 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 we're just going to have them push buttons and guess. Brilliant idea. Now, it turns out listeners are not that great at it. Uh, they're above chance. Almost all listeners are about 30% accurate if it was a female talker and about 35% you know, accurate as a male. So not great, but they can do it. Um, they're a little bit better on voiceless and voice fricatives and so forth. Now, a second group of listeners saw a still face of the talker, and they got the letter to tell them what the actual fricative was. So now, there's no actual articulatory information here about the vowel. It's telling them the cause. It's saying, this was a s spoken by a man, right? And that's what you know. And we asked them to do the exact same thing afterwards, and performance goes up in every cell. Um, it's about the doubling of the gains above chance, which is pretty impressive. And virtually all listeners, again, showed this, this large uh, effect. So you can think about this now as a pretty interesting model. So I know a little bit. I see Bob's up there, and I can predict that this is how Bob produces his S's. When I get an actual token, I can then compare it and maybe make a prediction about the vowel. And then I get the actual vowel, and I compare it, and I make predictions about the next sound and so forth. So it leads to this sort of chain of explanation. And as you accumulate more and more information, you can be better and better at perceiving speech. Now, so what I've shown you so far is that evaluating the signal relative to expectations helps listeners get more out of the signal. If you know the vowel, it improves the fricative perception. Actually, I haven't shown you that, but we have a, another paper where we go backward in time and show that. And knowing the fricative improves vowel perception. So where speech scientists have kind of classically defined this problem is, how do I tell if it's a ba or a pa? And I've written like seven papers on that. So I'm, I'm part of the problem here. It's actually a lot easier if you think about trying to solve both problems simultaneously, if you're identifying talkers and phonemes and multiple phonemes altogether. And these expectations can come from other parts of the signal, 
or from higher level cognition. And we're start to see how these expectations might help deal with time. It might help you make predictions about things that are coming up or revising ambiguity in the past. Now, there's one really bold, unsupported prediction we made from this model that I now want to talk you guys through. And it's this, that when you form expectations, they're at a sensory level. This was a prediction we made because of the way predictive coding models in vision and motor control work. It's not sort of abstract. It's I actually expect to, it to sound like X. But of course, most speech people would tell you it's a heck of a lot easier to just shift your boundary. You identify the talker, and you shift the boundary between the phonemes. Right? You're not really predicting how that talker sounds. You're reinterpreting. Now, we wanted to test this prediction, but the problem is that in, in behavioral measures, there really is no good way to do it. Pisoni and Tash pointed out years ago that whenever you try to extract some behavior in speech, no matter how good you think you are, it's always going to be a product of multiple levels of the system. So instead, we turn to some neuroscience. And it's not even very good neuroscience. I, I barely call it neuroscience. It's ERPs. But it's neuroscience, and we're going we're gonna to use it. So we've been looking at the auditory N1 in our lab recently. We think this is generated in Heschel's drivers. Actually, I think uh, Eddie told us this morning it's probably generated in what's caudal STG. Um, so I'll buy that. That seems reasonable to me. Um, it responds to lots of auditory signals, responds to change. Um, but my student Joe Toscano discovered that it also seems to respond to phonetic cues. He ran a really simple experiment. We, we made beach peach and dark tart continua, and we put people in the ERP booth and had them make some simple decisions about them. And this is what we found. As you move from a good beach with a VOT of 0 up to a good peach with a VOT of 40, you get this sort of rainbow-like shift in the N1. It's like the N1 is like coding the VOT. It's like a, the cool index of VOT encoding. And you can see it's very linear. It's not affected by the listener's response. It's not affected by the listener's own boundaries. It's this sort of linear response to VOT. So this is how we can look at whether expectations shape Q encoding. So my student Kayleen Schreiber and I have asked real recently, and this is just hot off the presses, is does this linear N1 response get shifted by expectations from context? And we know that men tend to produce shorter VOTs than women. It has to do with the way the larynx works and some sociolinguistic markers. And so if you know if it's a male or a female, you might shift the boundary of a, of a VOT continuum. right? We wanted to know what affects the N1. So we borrowed a, 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 a design, actually, from, from Keith and, um, and um, um, whatever. No, dang it. First author, um, Strand, Elizabeth Strand. Um, we created carrier phrases spoken by a male or a female. And we made gender ambiguous VOT continua. So they would actually hear beach or peach that could be either male or female. So same stimulus, different context. These are the behavioral choices the subjects made. You can see they had a nice big shift on their boundary. So when the same token was preceded by a male voice, they were more likely to call it pa than when it was preceded by a female voice. But of course, the question is, what happens to the N1? Now, this is the N1 with respect to VOT. We get this much bigger span in carrier sentences, which is kind of cool. We don't have a good explanation for that, um, although it might be related to this onset uh, detection effect you pointed out this morning, Eddie, because uh, the other ones were in quiet. But here's the effect of the talker voice. And you can see a very large change right at the N1 between the male and female uh, speakers. And they line up pretty perfectly. It's not uh, isolated to any one VOT. So this suggests that expectations about the talker shape how voice onset time is encoded, all the way down at the level of Q encoding. Uh, this is not just local auditory contrast. We've, we've re replicated this experiment where we take the preceding word and it's also gender neutral. We haven't done the cool expectation manipulation yet where you say, this is male. How do you think it, right? That's the, really, that's the cool one. We're doing that now. Um, we don't know that, so that would really assert that it's top down. So OK, I'm going to set up a simple story for you, and then I'm going to knock it down, because that's what we're going to do today. The simple story is, over the long term, listeners develop knowledge about how talkers or dialects or phonemes sound. And then in real time, you form sensory level expectations about what speech should sound like, which explains some, sort of the, some portion of the variance and help you evaluate new information. So this seems like you know, this big unifying principle of speech perception, but I'm not that bold. Um, it's consistent with neural models. It's computationally powerful, blah, 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 right? The problem is, it's not that simple. Um, so you know, if you were a, you know, a hardcore theoretician, you'd say, well, this all sounds like sort of a Bayesian kind of framework. And, and I think it's quite consistent with that. But there's two other commitments that come along for the ride in a sort of data explanatory framework. 
The first is that it helps to be graded. It helps to not make a categorical decision. And the second is that continuous uptake of information is, is also very helpful. And these are things that I have argued for for the last decade. And I'm going to show you data from my own lab that suggests it's not this simple. So what do I mean by partial commitments? Well, take our cues for S and S. So these are all the sources of variance that affect S and S. These are tokens in the lab, and this is all the stuff that could matter. There's all the unexplained variance. There's a lot of unexplained variance. If you put the same person in the lab and make them say the same speech sound three times in a row, about 40% of the variance is unexplained. right? So listeners aren't just dealing with lawful variability that they could potentially partial out using our beautiful model. But they also have to deal with just pure uncertainty. You're just not always sure. So how do you do that? Well, one way you do that is don't commit too hard. So let's take, for example, uh, VOT again. Here's our VOT. We can go and measure a bunch, and we get these lovely Gaussian distributions right? that overlap. So how do you deal with this variability? Well, one way is just to hedge your bets. And I mean by that, if you get a VOT down here at like 0 or 10, you can commit. You can be quite sure that the most likely response at that point is a B. And same out here, if you get a VOT of 60, that's a P. But in the middle, maybe you want to hedge your bets. Maybe you want to keep both options available until you get a little more information. right? So the degree of commitment should match whether the VOT, or how likely the VOT is to be a B or a P. And decades of work has shown that this is what people do. I mean, I think the coolest is actually Joanne Miller's work uh, from just around the corner, where she measured the frequency of different VOTs and they did these goodness ratings, like how good of a PA is this? And they line up nearly perfectly, right? People have a sense of what's a good PA and what's a good PA. And that's a pretty optimal way to, in, to, to, to make a decision. Now, this kind of gradiency is helpful if you want to calibrate your level of uncertainty. And it's a critical property of data explanatory models, like my own, like Florian Yeager's and Dave Kleinschmidt's, like a lot of them. But the problem is, and we just discovered this recently, not everyone does it this way. Um, so Jan Edwards and Ben Munson have been working with this really simple task where you give people a token from a BP continuum, like build a pill, and you just have them click like how B-like it is on a number line. And what they find are these very stark individual differences. Like this subject here says everything is a B or a P, and rarely ever chooses anything in the middle. This subject here chooses the whole number line. They're actually pretty good at lining up with what the actual VOT is. Uh, same here, you can see the same. And it's remarkably reliable. Like if you do this on the same subject twice in a row, you get strong test retest reliability. People have fundamentally different ways of categorizing speech sounds. Oh, you can't see those graphs, but they're not that great. Um, what, what Jan and Effie and I showed recently is people are graded, it's reliable, and it's not related to the usual suspects. It's not that better language users are graded and worse ones are categorical or vice versa, or better executive function leads to one or the other. And I think even more problematic for me, um, being doesn't even help you in speech and noise perception. People who are categorical are just as good at perceiving speech under adverse conditions as people who are grading it. It's like there's two ways to solve the problem. And, and some people do it one way, and some people do it the other. Uh, and maybe that gets back to the sort of multiple routes model that we were talking about earlier. Now, we also did our N1 paradigm with the ERPs with this. And we split it by whether you're high, high categorical or low categorical or gradient. And you can actually see this, this crazy little gap here, right? Right here between step four and five, there's this gap that you don't see in the gradient group. And we do our model fits. We actually can pull it out. There's like the, the categorical people are going along, and they get to the phoneme boundary, a little bump in their N1s. It's like at the sort of early auditory encoding level, they're a little bit different than everybody else. Um, and, and I mean, that was kind of surprising. We don't know why that is, I'll be honest. It's, it doesn't seem like it'd be all that useful, but yet they do it. Or, or maybe these guys are the ones that aren't useful anymore. Who am I to say? Um, but there's this kind of robust difference. And the only we found has been this, this low level response from the N1. So not everyone is gradient. It's not related to the usual suspect of major psycholinguistic abilities. Um, it does derive in part from differences in auditory processes. And we have found that it's moderately correlated with other things, like people who are gradient are slightly better at integrating multiple cues, sometimes. Um, they're better at resolving lexical garden paths and things like that. So it has some, some, some issues around the edges, but it's not as important as I used to say it was. Now, the other uh, piece of kind of evidence that I think is challenging for creating a unif unifying account is, is the problem of time. So we've been glossing over that, right? We sort of say, hey, look, here's all the cues. Can you categorize it? But in real speech, the information unfolds over time. And in fact, if you were to take a word here like pepper, and say you're interested in this P, 
the, the, the cues are everywhere. So the duration of the closure, the second and first form, it's after the P, the second and first form is before the P, the duration of this vowel, the duration of that vowel. You actually need to look at about a 400 to 500 millisecond window to categorize that P. Um, because the information is all over the place. And people have been shown to use all of this information in making these decisions. So how do you integrate this over time? And that's the question we've been asking now for a while. And let's simplify it a little bit. Let's look at just voice onset time and vowel length. Those are two cues that distinguish B and P. And you could imagine two models for how people do this. In one model, you get the VOT and you sort of store it in a little memory buffer. And when you get the vowel length, you put it in the buffer. And then finally, you can say, oh, it's a B. I'm going to start doing something like that, right? And then you get the cha on the end, and you're happy. Another model, though, you might get the, the VOT and immediately partially activate some things. Not fully, but a little bit. Could mostly be maybe a little P. And when you get the vowel length, you update. So this is more of a continuous uptake model. And we've argued that this is a better type of model. Graceful. You can, if the VOT never comes, right, you don't have to wait for it to release your buffer. Um, if you're waiting 200 milliseconds to the end of the vowel, you can do something while you wait. You have access to those preliminary states. And of course, you can use these early cues to build expectations about the later cues. So this idea of continuous uptake is kind of part and parcel of this idea of making predictions and explaining the data. Now, we've been testing this with an eye tracking paradigm, and I'm really not going to go into any of the details. So if anybody wants to know, just ask me about it. But the idea is you hear beach or peach, and you click on it. And you make, we monitor eye movements while people do this really trivial task. And people will make eye movements from about 200 milliseconds after b, which reflect the information they've got at 200 milliseconds in. And what you do is you, you go through this process of determining when each cue in the signal influences the bias between B or P. And what you see typically is evidence for a continuous mapping model where VOT influences your bias at the level of the as soon as it arrives, and about 100 milliseconds later, the length of the vowel comes in. So as soon as you get the VOT, you're able to partially activate words. Right? You don't have to wait. And this has been shown for lots of different cues, stop voicing, approximance vowels. It's been shown for the Ganong effect. It's been shown for rate compensation. Anywhere you look, you see this very intricate time locking between the dynamics of choosing a word and the dynamics of the cues rolling in. Now, my student Marcus Gala recently did this with fricatives. And his thought was that fricatives are auditorially pretty cool because they've got a very high frequency component that's somewhat distinct from a low frequency component. We didn't think anything was going to be done with fricatives, but we thought it would be important to, to check that out. And we manipulated three cues. We have the spectrum of the frication ranging from S to S. We have the co-articulation. And we have the identity of the vowel. So people are hearing soar, shore, continua, and ship, ship, continua. And then we monitor when each of these sources of information gets used. And the striking thing was they all got used at exactly the same time. And they all get used at the onset of the vocoid. So people are sitting there. The fricatives are 300 milliseconds long. People sit there for 300 milliseconds not looking at anything. And when the vocoid comes in, they suddenly use all three sources of information simultaneously. Now, we've replicated this four times. We've replicated this with different stimuli. We have um, pushed around the onset of the vocoid. It pushes around the onset of these effects. It's really robust, but it makes no sense, right? Um, in fact, people, while they're waiting, don't even know that it is a fricative. I mean, it's not like they're looking at the S's and the S's, but they don't know which one it is. They're it either. Now, they know it's a, if it's a stop, if it's a B or P, they know that immediately. But when it's a fricative, they just sit there and wait. Can you just go back? Yeah. So this is the task, right? So you'd hear soar, in this case, that's lake or rake, but you'd hear soar, shore, right? And you'd, you'd click on it. And we monitor eye movements while you're doing that task. So the eye movements generated at 200 milliseconds reflect the processing that's happened up to that point. Right? And the eye movements generated at 400 milliseconds reflect the processing that's happened up to that point. And so by averaging across a lot of trials, we can ask, what does the listener know at each point in processing? Is the listener using, say, the frication spectrum to bias their fixations at 300 milliseconds out, at 400 milliseconds out? Or are they using the formant transitions at each time point? Does that make sense? So the idea is that the relative one or the other reflects what they, what they the, have. the distribution they're having. Exactly. Well, it reflects, it, not necessarily the head, it reflects what they're using at that moment, right? 
Um, and so, I mean, they know, and, and, and they know that these S's and S's are, are easily discriminable. They have the distribution, but they don't seem to use it to make contact with meaning at that point in time, right? It's not, it's not, it's not biasing their behavior yet. Um, it does bias their behavior 300 milliseconds later. Has a, it exerts a strong bias on their behavior, but it doesn't get used at this very early moment in time. Does that make sense? As, as, as. Differentially, exactly. Um, and they do do this for other cues, right? They do this for VOT, they do this for VAWA, they do this for vowels. The task eventually is to pay. Correct. And you, you don't no. so in fact, we tell them not to pay any attention to their fixations. If we could do it without an eye tracker so they really wouldn't know, we would. Right? And we don't give them a time deadline. So it's just do this task as naturally as possible. This is actually a task we use with, with people with hearing impairment and with children. It's a very easy task. But it's also very natural because it's measuring me basically interpretation. Right? It's measuring what people interpret every four milliseconds of the choices we gave them, of course. Um, does that make sense? So this is a mystery to me, um, why this would be the case. Um, why, I mean, why would fricatives work so differently than other speech sounds? Um, and it might just be their auditory. Fricatives are pretty unique among speech sounds. There's no periodicity. There's no low frequency energy. In fact, back when people were debating whether speech is special, um, people like Robert Ramez would say, well, we can't use Bregman-esque streaming for speech because the fricatives would peel off. Well, maybe the fricatives do peel off. Maybe they are different, right? And, and, and that's kind of a facetious thing to say. But, but we're, we're a little stumped on this one. Um, what it, I think it does suggest that maybe um, people in psycholinguistics who sort of like to think about speech in terms of these all-encompassing models like data explanation or exemplar models, that, that maybe we need to really think about auditory processing before you get to your exemplar model or your data explanatory model or whatever kind of model you're using. There's some level of auditory integration that, that has to happen. So I'm going to now ride off into the sunset um, and just give you a quick summary and some, some conclusions. Um, first, I, I think I showed you that data, explana data explanatory approaches can account for ver lawful variability in the signal. Um, perception and the difference between what you expect and what you hear. These expectations can be quite general, like when we showed people the still faces and high levels, but they could also come from neighboring phonemes and so forth. And they affect how cues are encoded. Um, and I think this can also help contribute to integrating material over time by helping you anticipate new sounds or resolve ambiguity in the past. But this changes the goal of perception. The goal of perception is not just to classify the input, it's to explain it. What things gave rise to this variability I'm observing? Um, I also suggested uh, that there's some empirical evidence for this now, too. It, it offers a better account of listener perception in our sort of free response task. The cause of fricatives, it improves anticipation, and talker expectations will even alter EMP, ERP components of pre-categorical processing. So you might say we've been talking a lot about representation today, but to me this suggests that the categories aren't in the signal, and they may not really be in the head, that really we should be emphasizing processing. How you those categories might be more important than what they are. But I also showed you at the end that this is not enough. Um, you might argue, and I have, that uncertainty demands a graded commitment, but not everybody does it this way. And there are some differences in how people categorize speech that might just derive from very early auditory differences. I've also argued that immediate integration of cues is the norm, and it's probably a more efficient way to process speech. But fricatives don't work that way. Listeners seem to wait it out for at least 300 milliseconds before they're ready to make any commitments. And that goes flies in the face of a ton of work in psycholinguistics for the last 40 years. So I'm going to argue in the end that a unifying account might not be possible, and it might not even be desirable. Um, instead, that speech perception may derive from a constellation of, of mechanisms that might be redundant. So I've just talked about two here, data explanatory mechanisms. But clearly, auditory constraints are important. But maybe some of these other things, exemplar encoding or competition dynamics are right, or the idea of multiple routes. And I think these are likely redundant. I think there are multiple solve this problem. This problem is not insolvable. And as a result, different people, and we've seen this in our own data, might deploy these kind of mechanisms differently. Thank you very much.